Uh, hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. We are really happy to see this number of people interested in machine learning. Um, I'm Matt Lilly, a data science engineer and a co-founder of PyLadies Tunis, along with Mune Belaid, a business intelligence data consultant, and Hidyat Mani, a postdoctoral fellow at Pasteur Institute of Tunis. We are among a network of uh, Python practitioners in Tunis, Tunisia. We are passionate about the Python programming. In fact, uh, PyLadies Tunis is part of PyLadies Global Community. We are an international mentorship group that helps people become active participants and leaders, especially women, in the Python open source community. We are very proud that our community is growing day by day. In fact, we have 76 chapters with over 50,000 members located in 29 countries and 74 cities. Our mission is to promote, educate, and advance a diverse Python community through outreach, education, conferences, events, and social gatherings. PyLadies also aims to provide a friendly support network for women and uh, British to the larger Python world. Anyone with an interest in Python is encouraged to participate. We are starting our second series entitled Machine Learning in the Cloud. We are starting this series with today's session, MLOps Tools and Steps to Scale a um, uh, Machine Learning Model. Our second session in uh, this series would be held on the 6th of November, Build, Train and Deploy ML Models on AWS. Our third session would be held on the 20th of November about the deployment of machine learning models at Google and Vertex AI system services. Please join our meetup group and stay tuned. Now I will let the floor to Munevalid. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Amel. So mm -hmm. if you, yeah, so if you want to have um, to have a look at our previous meetups, uh, I invite you to have a look at our YouTube channel. Uh, so you covered before different topics. Uh, Amel will share the link in the chat. Uh, okay. Also, you are active on many social media platforms, so Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. Uh, you are welcome to to be following us. Uh, you are really pleased today to be hosting uh, Emira Dineri, and uh, Emira so will talk about MLOps and uh, cover so what about the tools and steps to scale a machine learning model. I'm sure we learn a lot from Emira. So Emira is a machine learning engineer at uh, H&M Sweden. Uh, she's also an engineer in uh, applied mathematics to finance, and she worked on different projects uh, in different stages from uh, proof of uh, concept to production. Uh, so before you start, uh, as I told you, you are making so are making a recording video. If you prefer not to be rec recorded, please turn off your video. Uh, if you have any question, comment, uh, so you are free if you want to unmute yourself or just you leave your question in the chat. And uh, yeah, let's just keep also making this place a welcoming and friendly environment or community for everyone. Uh, thank you all for your attention and uh, the sc screen is yours, Emira. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. So let me share the, my uh, screen this time. Yes. Please tell me when you see my screen. It's okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so uh, as Muna and Amel mentioned, today we will be uh, covering the steps and tools for uh, MLOps or to scale machine learning models with MLOps. And the agenda will look like uh, the next. So I will give a brief introduction about me, and I think Muna already covered that. And then I will give the motivation on why we need MLOps and when. And then uh, I will give small uh, definition um, for MLOps. And then we will cover the data ML pipelines, model versioning, uh, data quality checks, testing and deployment when it comes to MLOps. So um, as you said, Mona, uh, I'm, I have an uh, engineering diploma in applied mathematics to finance from engineering school of Tunis, 
or, or what's called INIT from 2015. Then I had my uh, internship or final year project in computer vision uh, domain uh, in the computer vision department at the University of Florida in 2018. And then I started my career as a data analyst with Emerson, uh, when, where I worked with IoT data mainly. And then I switched uh, a bit and started to use more big data um, tools like Spark Scala. And I worked as big data engineer or co consultant at Orange and Decathlon in France. And then I moved uh, to uh, Sweden to start my uh, machine learning engineering um, journey with H&M. 2020. So, uh, yeah, so now I will explain why we need MLOps at the first place. And I will explain it by giving an example uh, from HM. So, uh, for those who does not know, HM, HM is a fast fashion company and uh, it is present in more than 70 countries. And please pay attention to these uh, numbers. Uh, so it's uh, present in more than 70 countries with more 5,000 5, physical stores and on online channels or uh, with the online apps, we are present in more than 50 countries. And when H&M starts tackling a problem, we start by doing a POC like any other data-driven company. And when that POC uh, proves to be successful, then we start thinking about industrializing and scaling that proof of concept or POC to serve all these stores, meaning 5,000 stores or 50 different countries. So if your POC is, um, uh, is uh, presented by a, a notebook like Jupyter Notebook or any other kind of notebook, you, it will be a bit hard to deploy that notebook to serve all these uh, stores and countries, online countries. So that's why when we started to adopt MLOps tools and steps in order to, um, to, to, uh, to do it in a faster way and a more robust way. So this is the definition I found for MLOps and I found I find it really straightforward. So MLOps is a set of practices that aims to deploy and maintain machine learning models in production to be reliable and efficient. And it is a combination of the two words, ML for machining, machine learning and uh, ops, which, which is coming from the DevOps uh, in the development uh, field. And um, what, what I want you to pay attention in here, since the MLOps is the combination of two, then we will need to uh, use tools that serves both machine learning and operations or ops. So when it comes to machine learning, the, the first uh, or the most important um, uh, tools or steps that we need to uh, pay attention to are the data and machine learning pipelines, and that will be the core of our application or code or software or system. And the second one is the model versioning. And then uh, when it comes to machine learning, of course, the data quality checks, because if you feed really bad data or data with no uh, good quality to your machine learning models, then no hyperparameter tuning will fix that. Um, when it comes to ops or operation, what we need to do after make sure everything in development is okay is to test um, our models or our pipelines and then deploy it, deploy the machine learning and data pipelines to production and hopefully scale it. Scale it meaning, meaning go from one country serving one country or one store or from POC to serving 5,000 stores, physical stores or 50 different countries um, online. Uh, I hope the, the problem you are tackling is really clear for the audience. So the first part is the data and machine learning pipelines. And I'll start by explaining the tools and how we can, the tool at least, and how we can use that tool uh, to, um, to satisfy the data and machine learning pipelines uh, step. 
So the first tool that I have chosen for you is Airflow, and I have chosen Airflow for a reason because it's Python based, which means it's Python package, so you can do your pip install Airflow and then uh, import Airflow in order to use Airflow in your local machine or uh, at any other environment. So Airflow is Python based and it is a workflow management platform. And when I say workflow management platform, it can cover both machine learning uh, workflows or pipelines or data workflows or pipelines. So what uh, Airflow offers is, or the benefit um, of using Airflow that it creates a DAG or what we call directed acyclic graph. And it is a set or collection of tasks, which you see in here as green boxes at your right hand. Uh, we call these small boxes tasks in Airflow and this whole thing a DAG. So again, a DAG is a set of um, or collection of tasks that are related to, it, uh, to each other in a way that reflects uh, the logical relationship between those tasks or steps. And the relationships, as you can see in here, could be like sequential kind of, kind of relationship. It means like this task should run before the second task, or it can be parallel kind of relationship when two tasks can run at the same time. So Airflow, we use it. It's Python based. We can use it to create this DAG. It's more visual friendly uh, kind of tool. So instead you have all your, uh, all your steps um, in um, your machine learning project, in a notebook, a messy notebook, you can have it in a DAG in a way that reflects the relationship between these um, steps in a more clear way. And a um, really cool thing about Airflow, in order to, to create this DAG, you only need to uh, write another Python script. So if your Python, um, if your Python um, uh, dependent person, or if you're someone who mastered Python and wants to start with a tool to uh, use workflow management platforms, Airflow is the first tool I can uh, recommend. And you can just write um, a Python script with this uh, list or the sets of the tasks that you will need in your DAG and the relationship again between these, um, between these tasks. And again, there is two types of relationships uh, in uh, a DAG in Airflow, either sequential kind of relationship or parallel kind of relationship. Uh, now we'll dig deeper to um, how Airflow functions, and then we will explain how we can use Airflow to scale machine learning uh, models from uh, box or proof of concepts to production. So Airflow has these um, five components that you see on your right hand. The first one is the web server or the web interface, and it's the, um, uh, the tool that you use in order to visualize and to see your uh, DAGs, if it's running, successful, completed, and also the different tasks in that DAG. So in order to see uh, this DAG, you only need to get to your web server and you can see like all the DAGs that you have or that you have run. So, uh, yeah. So sorry, Emira, to interrupt you. You have a question from Yasin. Yes. Okay. Uh, he's asking, we don't use Jupyter Notebook in ML Ops. What uh, you used to deploy? I didn't get the question. Can you repeat, please? You don't use Jupyter Notebook in ML Ops. What you used to deploy? So uh, maybe he can uh, explain more what he, he wants to get as answer. I think that uh, which. Uh language or uh, we use a uh, you use a Jupyter or uh, and to deploy the model yes yeah. you mean at this stage so so yeah a POC you can write it in Python Jupyter notebook or any other language it doesn't depend on the language but I'm just talking about how you can take that notebook and you can um, scale it and deploy it to production. So if you use a notebook in here in your POC or proof of concept, you can deploy 5,000 
different notebooks that you will run manually to um, to serve uh, these 5,000 physical stores. That doesn't make any sense. So you need an automatic way in order to transform that notebook to something more automated and fast. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I said, okay, thanks. So yeah, uh, and as the first option to get rid of your notebook is to start adopting Airflow. And I will explain how you can move from a notebook to, uh, to a DAG or what you see in here, what we will call DAG. Um, so uh, again, the, the five components for Airflow, the first component is the web server and it's the location that where you can see or visually see these DAGs, the status of these DAGs, if it's running, completed, uh, successful or failing. And the second component is a database and it's, it's sequential database uh, usually where you can store the metadata of the different DAGs that you have run or triggered. Uh, and you can see like for different DAGs, the, the number of times that you have run that DAG, the last time you have run that DAG and that kind of metadata. And then we have another uh, component that we call a scheduler. And what scheduler does, it orchestrates the execution of a DAG when it is queued or um, and to put it to a queued status and to trigger uh, the, the tasks that are uh, decided to be queued and triggered. And uh, the queue is just when a scheduler decides that this task or this small box should be the one next to be running, then that task will be in the queue status and the workers or worker is the component that will be doing the heavy lifting and it will be the one running the, the job or running the functions uh, in your DAG. So uh, the scheduler, it's just an orchestrator. It doesn't do anything. It sends everything. Uh, it just decides wh which tasks and which DAG to run next. And then the workers will be the one doing um, the heavy lifting and executing uh, the functions and the job. And another um, part of the, or one of the components that is hidden inside the scheduler, we call it executor. And what executor does, so after schedule decides which task that will be running next, the executor will be um, deciding um, uh, the infrastructure and um, the infrastructure and the best way to uh, deploy and uh, to uh, transfer um, uh, and divide uh, the, the workload among these workers in the most optimized way. So when it comes to infrastructure or, or when it comes to um, the resources needed, like the CPUs and memories and how many number of workers needed, that's the executor work. So the scheduler will be the one deciding how many tasks that we will, we will run in the next uh, shot and the executors will um, decide how many workers, the memory and CPU and all the resources related kind of uh, decision. And in Airflow, we have two kind of executors, local executors, and I have stated a bunch of in here, like sequential executor, local executor, and debug executor. And this one you can use if you run Airflow on your local machine. But if you want to run Airflow with more memory and CPU and to uh, like um, use uh, and deploy Airflow to different stores, as I gave the example of H&M uh, or different countries, then you need to use remote executor. And we have three options like Dask executor, Kubernetes executor, and Celery executor. And what um, we often use is Kubernetes executor for a simple reason, it gives really great flexibility when it comes to scaling out and down the resources. So what uh, a Kubernetes executor does, it creates the memory and CPUs for the different workers. You can go to 
1,000 workers at the same time, and when you don't have any um, uh, production load, then the number of executors will be zero and you won't waste any resources. Um, I hope this is clear enough. And now I'll explain how Airflow works with Kubernetes uh, as an executor. So uh, the Kubernetes executor will create a new pod for every task instance. And if you have uh, different DAGs and these DAGs will be running in, uh, in tasks, n number of tasks at the same time, what the Kubernetes execu executor will do uh, it will um, deploy or create n different worker pods in Kubernetes uh, cluster. And for people um, familiar with Kubernetes, I think this will make uh, a bit of sense uh, for them. And in order to uh, create uh, these worker pods or for each, since for each task we will have um, a correspondent worker pod, you need to uh, configure the memory allocation and the CPU for that, that worker pod and the airflow image or the Docker image that you will be pulling the, um, uh, that will be executing uh, the function. And this is an example on what you expect or what I mean uh, by that for each uh, task, for each task we'll, we'll create a new pod. So if you, uh, if you check your um, uh, Kubernetes client, so if we have these two tasks, task one and task two started to run, then you will see that this task two uh, is uh, in order to be created or what we call contra container creating status. So it started to be created. And if they both of them have been completed, then you will see that the status is completed. So for each task, you will expect that you will see separate pod with the status of that pod. So if this task is running, then you will see the stats as running. And if they are completed, as you see in here, since they are green, then you will see the status as completed. And this is what I mean, but for each task, um, uh, Airflow uh, Kubernetes or Kubernetes executor will create a separate um, uh, pod in uh, Kubernetes cluster. And now let's get back to the funny stuff. So that's a bit of infrastructure and uh, um, uh, kind of explanation. But now I said that in order to create the DAG in Airflow, you need to write a Python script. So back to Python now. And Airflow offers a different type of operators, what we call operator. And in here, I, will, I can like explain what an operator is. Is. So an operator is what will be running inside the task or these uh, small boxes. So if you have chosen to run a bash command or um, uh, any bash script, then you will be calling a bash operator. But if you want to execute a Python function, then you will call, call it or you will call or need a Python operator. And there is um, other and a lot of other operators that Airflow uses in order to run tasks with different languages, for example, and different external uh, tools. We'll see some of them um, after. And as you can see, after you decide which operator you will be using, then you just at the bottom of this um, uh, script, you can see that we are defining the relationship between the different tasks in here, and it is a sequential kind of relationship. So you have operator hello should start before operator greet, and then operator sleep, and then operator respond, which is reflected in this tag. So this small or one line of code is the one uh, shaping um, uh, our in here. Uh, hopefully, so far, so good. Yes. So now let, so I gave a bit of uh, explanation on how Airflow works or what is Airflow. And now let's see how we can use Airflow to get rid of that notebook we had in POC, and then we can uh, scale or deploy our uh, notebook or the code from uh, notebook to production. Uh, 
So, and this is classical machine learning project, and I will explain how we can use Air Airflow to replace uh, or uh, at each step of a classic ma machine learning project step, how we can use Airflow in there. And you know that the first step of a uh, machine learning project is to, to do the data collecting or what I call the data ETL means extract the data and then transform the, the data and then um, load the data. And of course you will, you will need some data transformation or cleaning and feature engineering. And then when you're um, finished with uh, all the data and you know that your data is good enough to start um, a training a model, then you will go to the model training and evaluation step. And um, you can run different uh, models with different hyperparameter uh, tuning um, kind of uh, techniques. And then once the model are decided then you can um, put your model uh, or what we call model serving and you will put your model or your expose your model to unseen data and then you will see if your model is behaving uh, good enough or not and this is what we call model serving in production since you will take the model that you have trained on batch data and then you put it in production on unseen or new data what, which we call model serving. So the first part, oops. So um, I will assume that your Python script or your uh, notebook, Jupyter notebook looks like this. So you can see from function one to function n minus three, we are reading different data inputs from different um, resources or sources. And um, if you're reading bits of high volume data, this can take uh, even a night running to read this data in sequential, da in sequential way. And then we will decide like to um, what we will do with these data, like the feature engineering, the data cleaning and transformation, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll go to the model training or model evaluating steps. So what you can do is to transform this notebook or Python script to Airflow da DAG and in more optimized way and that, is, that could be used in production. So these N, uh, M uh, inputs or um, that we are reading M inputs, we can replace it with M functions or M uh, tasks, sorry, um, in your Airflow DAG. And these M, uh, M tasks can be uh, running in parallel. So you, you don't need to wait uh, until all of them are read at the same or in sequential way. And you can gain a lot of time uh, by uh, parallelizing the data reading, um, the M input data reading, and then we can uh, have next the feature engineering, the model training, and the model evaluating. So let's say we are you are reading part like different partitions of data or M different resources, and only one resource will take two hours. So if you read it in sequential uh, way, then it would take more time than reading it in parallel uh, parallel way. And the airflow DAG in here will, will um, uh, uh, make it faster to read the data. And also, again, it's more visually friendly kind of a representation of what a machine learning project should look like. Um, so the second way on how to use Airflow is so um, to separate the steps that you have in classical machine learning a project. So as I said, you, you start with the ETL or the data cleaning part, the extraction, transformation, loading, and cleaning, feature engineering, et cetera, et cetera. And then you focus on the model training and model tracking and evaluating the model. And then once the models are decided and you're satisfied with the models, then you can serve them. So what you can use is to separate these tasks uh, or steps and make it as uh, three different and separate DAGs. So the first DAG in here, it will be completely uh, separated from the second DAG and they can run independently 
and what you can gain in this from this. So again, back to our example, if you want to serve 5,000 physical stores or more than 50 countries, all these countries will have different data, right? And um, you want to run at least the first step or the data reading, transformation, feature engineering, cleaning 50 different times, right? And if you do this, um, in a sequential way or in a uh, Databricks notebook or a Jupyter notebook that will take forever to run uh, the data for each country separately. But if you uh, do it in the DAG, then automatically you will have 50 different trans uh, for this DAG. And then when you, you know that your data for all these countries are good enough, you can focus on the model training, and which is a separate um, DAG. And you don't need to waste time on reading the, these data. Uh, again, so your data will be written to, let's say, Data Lake, and you know it's uh, safe there. So then, then you can start by um, going to the second step or using the second DAG, which is the model training and tracking, and you can read those data from the uh, Data Lake, which are clean, transformed, and ready. And you will focus on the model training. And once your models are um, you're satisfied with the metrics and uh, the KPIs you had from the model, then you can decide to use the model serving DAG and this one can, use, can be used in production to serve these uh, different 50 countries or 5,000 different physical stores. Uh, I hope the example is uh, clear in here. And now, um, so I have mentioned at some point Airflow operators. So uh, another thing that Airflow offers is Databricks submit run operator. And for people familiar with Databricks, they know it's um, Databricks is a platform that offers a managed Spark. So you can use Databricks in order to run um, transformation and cleaning logic on really huge data. So if you want to, uh, or your Python operator or just using Python is not enough anymore and you need to use more distributed way, then you can um, uh, replace one of the tasks in here with the Databricks uh, operator instead of the Python op operator. And you will be uh, creating a Databricks notebook inside one of the tasks that will be reading huge data and transforming these data and then uh, writing it again to the uh, like final um, path or to your data lake again. Um, Yes, so this is how to use the first tool that I have mentioned, which is Airflow, to go from a pop or a notebook to um, deploy that notebook on different countries, different data, different models, and to serve them, uh, to use Airflow to serve every, everything in production. Now let's talk about model versioning because this is really a headache when it comes to uh, uh, deploying machine learning models in production. So uh, the second tool that I recommend when it comes to versioning your models in production is MLflow, Model Registry. And uh, MLflow is an open source uh, platform for managing the end-to-end -end machine learning lifecycle. And one of its component is MLflow model registry. And what uh, MLflow model registry does is, uh, as you can see on your right hand in here, you can see the different models that you had in in your development environment and the different versions. So let's say I I'm coll collaborating with a data scientist and I had uh, used one technique in this QRS model and the data scientist, he or she um, uh, used another technique. And then you will end up with two different versions with two different metrics and two different results, right? So what MLflow model registry will, will do it will um, uh, update uh, the status of uh, for that model, and it will you will see um, 
uh, in here that you have a bunch of different versions and you can check like who's the person, the person who did the changes or the latest um, modification. And then you can put, you can decide which version or which technique or which model to put in production. And that's something that you can decide together with um, your team members, like uh, which version of this model to put in production and which one you need to put in staging, uh, which means that you don't, you don't, you're not using production actually. Uh, yes. So, and uh, so how to use MLflow um, in production or how to use MLflow in your Python code that we have transformed that we started from a Databricks or a Jupyter notebook. Then we move to um, machine learning and data pipelines. And then we need those pipelines to communicate with MLflow. So you can see in a web UI or web um, uh, uh, interface, uh, like the versions and the models and which one you can like choose which one to put in production. And the idea is, uh, since MLflow provides a set of REST APIs to interact with its different components, so the idea is to use the MLflow APIs inside your uh, data pipelines or machine learning pipelines in order um, to connect uh, your model runs uh, to the endpoint where you uh, where all the model stages and versions can be visualized. So in one of these tasks. In one of these tasks that you will create in your Airflow DAG, the mission for that task is to interact with MLflow so you can, you can see the different versions and the stages for uh, the different models that you have um, uh, in your code. And uh, again, um, here when from, from this, uh, Airflow DAG or from this example where we can find MLflow is in the model evaluating. So again, MLflow has has different components. One of the uh, one of its components is called MLflow uh, tracking. So it tracks um, the evaluation or the metrics of the models and the results of the models that you have run in production. So we can use MLflow in this task, which is the model evaluation. And from this example, we can use again the model tracking in the model training and tracking DAG and the model uh, ML, MLflow model registry in the model serving DAG. So this one will be serving the production um, and you can see like the different results and the different models in, you have in production and which ones uh, are in production and which ones are uh, in staging. Just... Uh... Amira, sorry for interrupting you, yes. but we have a question here from Yasin. Yes. He yes. said, uh, can you show us examples for your project with Airflow? This is this is pretty much an example. This illustrate how a project can look like in Airflow. So you can move from any uh, different steps that you have in your Python script or Jupyter notebook, and you can transform, start transforming those functions to tasks in Airflow and you can visually see the, these and use these to, um, to serve di different, as I, as I uh, said again, different countries and different uh, physical stores. Okay, he said uh, real project, I don't know. Yeah, th this can be a real project. I mean, I'm just uh, illustrating it in an image, but you can uh, you can create an endpoint for your Airflow uh, web server, and there you can see you can create any DAG uh, there. Any other questions? Yes, we uh, have a question from Ale. Ale is here. Mm -hmm. uh, can we also add warning based on thresholds or checks for the evaluation metrics inside the ML flows and connect it to, to Slack and Teams to get updates and warnings? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. 
I'm really not sure if we can have um, like to connect it to Slack or Teams to uh, to set these kind of warnings. But what I know that if you have different versions in MLflow and you don't and you have a bunch of metrics, let's say the R2 square, the CMAP, and a lot of a lot of uh, metrics, and you don't as a data scientist or machine learning engineer, you really don't need to waste your time to see uh, the results of 50 different models or 100 different models. So one feature, cool feature MLflow has, you can uh, like choose the models or the versions you want to compare and you just check those versions and MLflow will show you the model or the version of that model with best metri metrics and you just put that in production and that's it. So, uh, so if you know that you have used different techniques to create different versions, you will know at some point you will have really great, um, hopefully really great metrics. And then uh, you can use the compare feature in MLflow to decide that this one, this is the best model or this is the best version and I need to put this in production. But uh, sorry, I really don't know if we can connect it to Slack and uh, Teams. Yeah, we have another another question here. I also would like to know how to use it in a real project. Could you please show the code using Airflow and the MLflow? Yeah, this is the. I mean, this is really an illustration for the code in MLflow or using Airflow. So your code, who used to look like this in a notebook, now it is in ID like PyCharm, for example, or Visual Studio, and you define. You will still have these functions, but you create a new. Um, script that I have shown in here, which will create your DAG. So you create an extra script, Python script, where you will say, well, I need this step first in my project, and then I need the second step and third step, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's the same set of functions that you have in your notebook or uh, in your original uh, project, and then you just create a new Python script where you, you um, set the, 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 the tasks and the relationship between these tasks uh, in your DAG and you can visually see that DAG. And again, for MLflow, you can use it in the model evaluating uh, task. Uh, since MLflow has um, a component that we call um, MLflow track, this one, MLflow tracking. And then instead of writing, for example, the results of your, um, uh, of your models in a text file or YAML file, you will see everything in a cool um, web interface like this. As simple as that. Okay, we have another question. Uh, for that, uh, you can use, I think, web automation if uh, there isn't built-in functionality in MLflow. There is what functionality again, ML? In, uh, in MLflow. If yeah. there, there isn't built-in functionality in MLflow. Ah, uh, I really didn't get the question exactly, but MLflow provides a uh, lot of built-in. No, it's, uh, it's, it's an answer to uh -huh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> but really great question, guys. Keep at it. So uh, the next headache for us in uh, the MLOps um, steps or life cycle, or you can call it whatever you want is the data quality checks. So let's say you created your fancy airflow DAG, you have the best models that you tuned with 1000 hyperparameter tuning different techniques. But if your data quality that you are reading uh, like on daily level are uh, trash, then you really can't do anything about it. So what we can do uh, to overcome this issue. So again, back to our airflow uh, DAG. So, uh, so 
as you can see in here, we are reading M different uh, data inputs, and then we are doing the feature engineering, and we can call these uh, tasks uh, as the ETL extraction, transform, and load uh, parts of the DAG, and then it's the model training and evaluating. I think you got, you got the drill. So um, at these tasks, again, we can introduce before loading or reading the data that we are reading from different uh, sources or M different data inputs. And after transforming them, we can decide and we can integrate the data quality validation to, uh, to decide if that data needs to go to production or if we need to use, if that data is good enough to be used to train the model or not. And there is two, um, two uh, severity index. I call it severity index. So the first one, we introduce a function or logic inside our Airflow DAG that checks if the data is good enough then we will uh, just go to the next task and we load the data to data lake, for example, or any other path. Or if it's not good enough, we can send warning emails to the different team members or to anyone uh, uh, really concerned with this. And there is more severe way to do it and is to have three different scenarios. Is The first one is to say, this data, this data is okay. I will just put it, uh, use it to do the model uh, training. And the second one, this data is not that great, but we still can use it. And you can, again, send a warning email for the concerned team members or persons. And if the data is really trash, you just break in here the, the, the DAG and you won't load that trash data to your data lake. And in some businesses or, or in some use cases, it is better to use yesterday's data to train the model than to use today's data if the data is really, really bad. And I can give an example in here. For example, if one of your data is the phone number uh, in that country and you know that the phone number should be 10 digits and for some reason at that day, all the data or all, all the rows in your data was empty, then you just need to drop it and you don't need to load that empty or a two digits kind of uh, phone number, which is invalid to your data lake to use it in the model training, then your model will really be biased and it won't give any good results. And uh, where we can use the data quality again is in the ETL data cleaning DAG. Um, that I have gave or explained uh, at some point um, in this presentation. Uh, and um, even this step or, uh, I mean, there is no specific tool to overcome this issue, but we can, with any Python function, like basic Python function, you can set the rules or um, what are the checks you need to do in order to say this data is okay, this data is not that okay, but we still can use it in, the, uh, in production or to train our model, which is more important, or uh, we need really to drop this data because it's, not, it's no good. Now for the, so um, I hope you get uh, this part, which is related to the machine learning from the ML ops, the machine learning operation um, uh, tools. So the first three uh, um, sections were for the machine learning, and now we will tackle the operation. And I don't um, I consider myself as uh, ex experienced really um, person in operations or in ops tools, but I will can give like a hinge how you we can use the different um, uh, uh, how we can use operations as it's defined in the most classic way in the DevOps and introduce it to the MLOps. 
that's the idea. So now, after you made you may you created your uh, airflow DAGs, you you are using uh, ML flow in order uh, to uh, check do the model versioning, and then you know that all the data that gets to the model training is really really good data. Then you need to do some testing before putting your uh, code to production, of course. Otherwise, uh, catastrophes can happen, right? So the different testing strategies, the first and the most basic one is to write unit tests. So if you created a function in Python that treats a data, a specific kind of data and does some transformation and output the data, so you need to use a unit test to test uh the different parts or function that you have in your code and that's the first uh, testing strategy i mentioned in here the second one is the smoke test and the smoke test is to test the end-to-end -end system or the end-to-end -end DAG, in our case, our airflow DAG, to make sure if we made any changes or if we, we have done any new uh, development, the new development didn't break anything in the DAG uh, and it's still running end-to-end -end successfully. And the, the last uh, testing strategy is the model evaluation test. So if you know for some reason that doing um, uh, introducing a new function should not uh, change the model metrics or the model results and you have created a model um, a test that compares uh, or check if the uh, model results have changed because of uh, the new development that you have done then something's wrong in the development that you have done and that code should not go to production because it's it's not uh, giving really good results or robust uh, results um, this is when it comes to uh, testing and for the deployment and something that I already mentioned uh, the airflow part, but I need to um, again, uh, maybe uh, mention it. So um, in order to deploy your code from development uh, environment to production environment, you will need to containerize or to use containers like Docker and Kubernetes. And we have talked about Kubernetes executors when it comes to Airflow, and it is really great way uh, to uh, move your code from, um, from uh, development to a production environment. And for Kubernetes, it is an open source platform for those who doesn't know Kubernetes. And it, it provides a powerful declaration API to run application in a group of Docker hosts. So if you're managing different Docker images, not just one, then Kubernetes uh, is really the tool for you um, to, to deploy these Docker images from uh, the development environment to production environment. And yeah, this is pretty much about it. Any other question? Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, yeah, if there is any other question, please don't hesitate to ask in chat. Thank you, Ali Edin, for coming along. Thank you. Yeah, let me stop sharing then. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, you are welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I will share with you uh, again our meetup group. So, uh, you can be notified about our uh, next meetups. Uh, so I should we do this link on the chat. Thank you all for attending this session. Thank you so much, Shemira, again, for sharing this with us. You're yes, welcome. please go ahead, Sahar, if you have a question. Good night, Rahul. Thank you. So I think so. Wow, thank you, everyone. Yeah, I think it's a good night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so I think so.
Okay. What is the best strategy to minimize the production gap? gap. Mm -hmm. Minimize the production gap. What do you mean by the production gap? You mean the testing? Uh, all of them. <laughs> so each testing strategy serves a different um, uh, intention or different uh, thing. So if you just want to test your functions, if it's running uh, as it should be, the unit test can do it. But you always need, especially if you're adopting the airflow DAX, then you need to run the smoke test. So if you introduce a new function, you, that function doesn't suppose to break anything in your airflow DAG. So that's what we call a smoke test. And also by introducing a new function in your code, the machine learning model's results should not uh, change. So if they change, then something is wrong. So all of them uh, should be uh, used in my, uh, in my uh, open view. Yeah, we have another question, Amira, for you. Uh, in terms of the deployment, uh, could you tell me how to find a real example? It will be better to real project with code. Thanks. Uh, in terms of deployment, I think there is a lot uh, of... Uh, question. Yeah, could you tell me how to find a, re a, an example. a real example? Uh, I think your best friend Google can help you in that. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is a lot of um, uh, projects that you can find on GitHub uh, that are inspired from real world uh, projects or um, uh, problems. Okay. okay thank you, guys. <laughs> Uh, so you have Farhat here saying uh, thank you so much for this presentation from what he understands about MLflow so he said all you said can be replaced with a batch script or whatever I don't really see the value added by these tools expect for the graphing interface no I haven't mentioned the batch script in MLflow so what MLflow does it shows or reflects the different versions for the models with the different techniques or the different models that you have trained in that fancy graphic interface or web interface. And um, the advantage is, as I said, it has a feature to compare the different versions and to move your model version, the, the desired mo model version from staging to production. So that model will be serving uh, the 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 um, company uh, customers, so that's the, that's how we use MLflow. Okay, I hope that's clear for you, Farhat. Um, thank you all again for coming. Okay, so you have Nervin. Uh, can you please do a small recap about oh, about all the steps and for the configuration, what kind of parameters should we consider? Okay, recap. Uh, to to start using MLOps, to start to use ML uh, MLOps, the first thing is to d define your machine learning and data pipeline, and there is different tools to use that and the one I have suggested for you and it's not exclusive is Airflow because it's Python based otherwise there is other tools like Kubeflow I can write it in the chat if you want or also MLflow can be a way to um, uh, to create machine learning pipeline or data pipeline then after that you can uh, use other tools like I mentioned MLflow and your data validation inside your a workflow or data pipeline and machine learning pipeline to make sure that the data coming and going from there is um, uh, is good enough to be to be used. I hope this is a good recap for you, Nirmi. And she said also for the configuration, what kind of parameters should we consider? Uh, 
parameters, uh, there is a really bunch of parameters. Um, maybe you should, I don't know, I, there, is, there is different, it really depends on the project. So yeah, I don't have a clear answer for this one. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you so much, Emira, for, yeah, she's saying, Nermi saying, thank, thank you so, so much. much. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for providing this useful information. Uh, and that's all. Good night, all. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Emira. You're welcome. Special thanks for you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Have Bye. a good night. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.